Good morning. Good morning. I figured out how to sing that song. I'm not going to say I figured it out, but I think I figured it out when we were almost done. I was like, wait, where did we go? <laughs> Turn with me to Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. Thank you, Rob, for that call to worship. That was very appropriate to our text. Did you plan that? No. Oh, wow. Very, very appropriate, yes. <laughs> And thank you, Nancy. Nice to have you back. She disappeared. There you are. You're where you always are, aren't you? Revelation chapter 20, <clears throat> verses 11 through 15 this morning. Be praying for everyone who, are, who is not here, everyone who is not here. We have many who are sick with sick little children. <clears throat> and I hear it's kind of rampant out on the West Coast, too. They're setting up emergency tents outside of ERs because of the respiratory and other problems that are occurring. So, yeah, be praying for everyone. Read 11 through 15. We'll open in prayer. And I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. And from his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for such plain language that we find here. Thank you for the fact that you have saved us. Those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ, you have saved us from this judgment. Thank you for the passage that Rob read earlier that our sins are separated from us as far as the east and the west because of what Christ has done, because of what He has accomplished. We thank You for such a great salvation. And Father, we thank You for the compassion that we saw there in that passage that was read. And we realize what we see here is no compassion shown. Help us, Father, each one of us, to realize that there is coming a time when there will be a final judgment. No more choices will be made on our part. Choices we've made will be choices that we will live with for eternity. Pray for each one of us, Father, as we look down through this passage that we will look at ourselves honestly, that we will see what road we're on, what path we're on, what part of chapter 20 we're in, the first part of the second part, the part that is full of hope, or the part that is so hopeless, it's terrifying. Help us, Father, to, to see ourselves as we are, that we are, all of us, sinners, all of us separated from you, but that we can be brought back into your presence because of Jesus and because of what He's done. If we place our faith in Him and believe in what He's done, trust Him and trust you. Again, Father, I pray for each of us that we, we look carefully at ourselves as we move through this. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I knew my opening illustration would not be as serious as it should be <laughs> for the passage here. But it came to mind. So, Melissa and I have been watching Perry Mason of an evening right before we go to bed. We'll turn on the TV and watch something just to kind of let our minds go in neutral for a while. And I guess Perry Mason, you may be judging me. I'm being a little open here, so don't, don't be mean. This may be what happens when you get old. Instead of watching the current stuff, you watch the old, old series. I can't stand the current stuff. A lot of it is not fit, shouldn't be watched. Uh, 
And uh, I don't know, I've gotten past the cool stuff, the, uh, the guy that never dies, and you know, all that kind of stuff, uh, all the shootouts and all that. So we've gone through Andy Griffith, and we've gone through Little House a long time ago. We've gone through Leave it to Beaver. Now we're working on Perry Mason. Um, it's interesting, as we watch this, uh, it's a very simple, very simple mystery show. Extremely predictable, uh, so much so that uh, we kind of joke about it a little bit. There's always a murder, of course. Uh, there um, are always several people that could be involved, four or five people, and that murder scene is always like a, a, a busy shopping mall. They've all been there, they've all seen the dead body, but only one of them did it. When you get to the end, when you get to the end, Perry Mason, as the defense attorney, never loses a case. Never loses a case. And poor prosecuting attorney Hamilton Berger always loses. We looked him, we looked these guys up, you know, on, online while we we're watching this to kind of get a little information just, you know, about them. And Hamilton Berger died of lung cancer at a fairly early age and did a TV commercial saying uh, he came on saying, take it from the losingest guy in the world. <laughs> you know, the one who loses all the time. You don't want to lose this way. But it's interesting when you look at it. Perry Mason never, never loses. The defendant always goes free. Always goes free. And as I said, very, very serious passage and maybe a little too lighthearted of an opening. But it came to mind because at this trial that we're looking at here, it's not really a trial. What we see in chapter 20 is a sentencing. This is a sentencing. And there is no defense attorney. They're standing before the judge with no one to defend them. And there is no hope that someone else is going to have the finger pointed at them. There's nowhere to hide. In fact, if you look at it there, heaven and earth, or earth and, and sky fled away. They stand alone, absolutely alone, before the judge. There's nowhere to hide. And no one, absolutely no one goes free. In fact, this is, this is the most hopeless situation there will ever be. We need to be careful not to confuse this with the, with the judgment seat of Christ where believers are going to have their, their works judged, where they're going to have their ministries judged, where they're going to be rewarded for their service or suffer loss for their service. The believers, remember, are all with Christ. They're all ruling with Him. Some of them have been raptured and are with Christ. Some have been martyred and have gone to be with Christ. We believe the Old Testament saints, somewhere in there, also were resurrected and, and brought <clears throat> before Christ. And now they're with Him also, reigning with Him. Some saints went straight from the millennium, in, or straight from the tribulation into the millennium. And if you remember, this all comprises the first resurrection. See it over there in chapter 20, verse 6. It says, Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with Him for a thousand years. So by this time, a thousand year millennial reign is over. Satan has been released he has raised up a rebellious army that was squashed in chapter 20, verse 9b. In fact, if you look at it, that whole effort of Satan and all of those people only receive a half of a verse. <laughs> it was squashed quickly. After Satan is thrown into the lake of fire, there he is united with the Antichrist and the false prophet. And look at the end of verse, or chapter 20, verse 10, the end of it there, and they will be tormented Day and night, forever and ever. And that's where we come upon this mind-blowing hopelessness. The second resurrection happens here in chapter 20, verse 11. These are the dead. These are the spiritually dead. All, all of those who have never placed their faith in Christ. Those who are still in their sins. They'll be judged according to their sins. The atoning sacrifice of Christ did not remove their sins as far as the east as is to the west. Their sins were not hurled into the depths of the sea to be long forgotten. 
Their sin remains on them, accusing them, because they rejected the free gift of eternal life that God has provided through Jesus Christ. And now here they stand before Christ, before the judge. The days when he offered to be their Savior are past. He is now judge. And they're condemned. And their punishment is eternal. Think about that again. To be tormented day and night, forever and ever. As I've said so many times, hard, hard to believe. Hard to fathom. We look at other parts of Scripture. We read other parts of Scripture and it makes sense. But we look at something like this and we just think, that's hard to grasp. It's hard to grasp, but then it's hard to really grasp grasp the hopelessness that's involved there. Never read Dante's Inferno. I've heard that it's full of some crazy things, some heresies, some doctrinally it's a mess, but Dante got one thing right. We hear it quoted often, maybe too often, but above the gates of hell are the words, abandon every hope, all you who enter here. Think about the stark difference that we see between the first half of this chapter and the second half. Believers are resurrected. They're given resurrection bodies. They are living. They are ruling with Christ for a thousand years. And, and that is, as it were, just the first day of eternity, right? They have eternity to experience His presence, to experience life without sin, to experience perfection. And then we have in 11 through 15 exactly the opposite, eternal punishment and no hope. I shouldn't have to say this as we, as we get to this and we begin to look at this, but every single one of us should be thinking, what part of chapter 20 am I, am I in? What road am I on? What, what path? What path am I, am I on? Am I, am I headed to something as wonderful as the resurrection, the first resurrection? Or have I not dealt with that? And am I just, you know, putting it off and, and not thinking about it, rejecting it in one way or the other? And am I in this second half? Have I placed my faith in Christ? Are my sins removed? Is Christ my Savior? Is He my elder brother? Am I a co-heir with Him? Or am I on the path to Him being only my judge? And a judge who shows no compassion at this point. It's hard to, hard to grasp. We're going to look at this in three, three parts. The opening scene, verses 11 and 12a. The grounds for conviction, 12b through 13. And then the conviction and sentencing, verses 14 and 15. So look at that stark opening scene again, 11 and 12a. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, and from his presence earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. This is an awesome, awesome scene. This is a scene that so many believe will never come. Never experience something like this, some people believe. They have, in fact, staked their whole eternity, the, the, their eternal future on the hope that they will never be accountable for their actions, for their decisions, for their deeds, for their thoughts. They believe that they could go on doing whatever they want, whatever they, whatever they feel like doing, and never be accountable. They believed, like, like so many people, Satan's oldest lie. Did God say that? No. No, you won't die. There is no accountability. That's been his lie, his deception from the beginning. And now, look at this. Here they stand. They stand before the, the judgment seat, a great white throne. And they're being held accountable. Again, for every thought, every word, every deed. Meticulous. He is meticulous and perfect in his 
knowledge of our sin. Throne, look at that. It, is, it speaks of a rule, doesn't it? It speaks of authority to rule. It speaks of judgment. A white aspect of it speaks to the purity of this, of this rule, the righteousness of this judge. And look at that. And there's one seated on it. I had a couple conversations this week at work with co-workers who, as I was looking at this text and thinking about this text, have placed themselves over God, have placed themselves in judgment over God. Talking about God, talking about the Bible, uh, they throw, throw out their, their arguments, their, their questions, their, their doubts, uh, seri not just doubts, but their serious, you know, no way, I do not believe that. And when I start to try to come back with, with answers, they don't, they don't want to hear it. They're not interested. They dismiss, they dismiss God. They discount the, 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 the idea that all of this is real. Think about how many people arrogantly do that, just disregard the God of the Bible, they dismiss Him. <laughs> but look at this, verse 11b. From His presence, earth and sky, or earth and heaven, fled away. No place found for them. This one, this one that they quickly sit in judgment over, they quickly just dismiss with a wave. Of the, they, don't want to, they don't even want to take the time to think about it. From this one's presence, earth and heaven flees. I, I, I'm, I'm looking at that thinking, what does this look like? <laughs> what, what, what did John see that, that made him write this? Earth and heaven <coughs> fleeing away. You, think about that. What, what does that leave? All that leaves is the throne, the one sitting on it, and you. And all these people. That's terrifying. He does exist. He cannot be dismissed. There is no place to hide. In fact, heaven and earth have been dismissed, right? <laughs> and now there's no, no reality except for Him. One commentator said this, the contrast between creator and creature could not be more dramatic. Here you stand. Who is that who is seated on the throne? You say, well, God, right? God the Son. Several, several verses from the New Testament. We could spend a lot of time looking at the verses that point to the fact that God has given all judgment to the Son, right? That God has said authority to execute judgment is His because He is the Son of Man. He is to judge the living and the dead. Paul wrote to Timothy, and we could go on and on. This is Jesus Christ. And Daniel, in his book in chapter 7, saw the same thing. There he was, seated on the throne, with his hair as white as wool. They rejected him and dismissed him. All those people down through time who now stand before him, and now they're going to be judged by him. Again, that earth and sky fleeting away, fled, fle fleeting away, is that the way you would say that? No place found for them. Ed Henson writes this about it. Many assume it is at this point that the earth and its atmosphere are dissolved. MacArthur calls this the uncreation of the universe, saying this, that this earth will still be tainted with sin and subject to the effects of the fall, decay, and death. Hence, it must be destroyed, since nothing corrupted by sin will be permitted to exist in the eternal state. God will, in its place, create a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth have passed away. Peter talks about that, doesn't he? 2 Peter 3, the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. And a little later, but according to His promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. It's amazing. Look at the rest of this opening scene. Who is, who is standing before the throne again? The dead. Great and small. 
everyone who ever existed who rejected Christ, who committed the awful offense of unbelief, as Hebrews goes into so much detail to talk about. Listen, listen to John Phillips. Again, he, does, he has such a unique way of, of painting a picture. He says, There is a terrible fellowship there. The dead, small and great, stand before God. Dead souls are united to dead bodies in a fellowship of horror and despair. Little men and paltry women whose lives were filled with pettiness, selfishness, and nasty little sins will be there. Those whose lives amounted to nothing will be there, whose very sins were drab and dowdy, mean, spiteful, peevish, groveling, vulgar, common, and cheap. The great will be there. Men who sinned with a high hand, with dash and courage and flair. Men like Alexander and Napoleon, Hitler and Stalin will be present. Men who went in for wickedness on a grand scale with the world for their stage and who died unrepentant at last. Now one and all are arraigned and on their way to be damned. A horrible fellowship congregated together for the first and last time. For the first and last time, all of these people together, the great and the small. Think about that. There are other, other ways we could describe the people that are there. Some of them are very spiritual. It's a phrase we hear today, isn't it? I'm spiritual, but I'm, but I'm not religious. I'm spiritual, but I don't go to church. I'm spiritual, but I don't believe in the Bible. There are many people who worship Creation. They worship false gods. They, they worship a distorted God taken from the Bible of their own making, and they call Him my God. Right? You hear that a lot. My God. It's a God they've made. A God, the true God they have rejected. They said, no, I don't want to see the details, the facts. I'm going to make Him the way I want to make Him. Pull a little here, a little there. There are some here who are very religious. They're not going to receive the, the gospel of the Bible, that salvation is by faith alone. Theirs was a works-based religion. My works save me. My works have a part in saving me. There are some scientists and philosophers who have concluded in the, in, in the great wisdom of their own minds that God simply does not exist. <laughs> Very smart people in some ways. Foolish in others. But you know who's not there? Romans 8.1 There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. For those who are in Christ. So if you are in Christ, if you are united to Him by faith, you are not here. Look, look at the grounds for conviction. Look, look at verses 12b and 13. And books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. So the new reigning king, new in the fact that he is now physically present on the earth, is going to judge all of the unsaved people who ever lived. And, and look at what it says, on the basis of what is written in the books, according to what they have done. You may think, now wait a minute, Troy, I thought that we were not saved based on our works. We, were, we are not saved based on what we've done. And biblically, how clear is it that our good works have no part in our salvation? Paul drives the point home relentlessly as, uh, as, as we see of Romans 3, Romans 4, uh, so many places, Galatians that we're looking at in Sunday school. Listen, listen to Romans 3, 21 through 25, and I'm going to read it in the today's English version. It's a simplified version, but a very accurate version when you, when you look at all the different translations, you read, the, you read what the original Greek says, and then you look at the TEV, and I'm surprised sometimes how simple it makes it and how accurate. So, so put it up against the, the translation you trust and, and read this passage and, and see. But listen to it. But now, God's way of putting men right with Himself has been revealed. 
and it has nothing to do with law. The law and the prophets gave their witness to it. God puts men right through their faith in Jesus Christ. God does this to all who believe in Christ because there is no difference at all. All men have sinned and are far away from God's saving presence. But by the free gift of God's grace, they are all put right with Him through Christ Jesus who sets them free. God offered Him so that by His death, He should become the means by which men's sins are forgiven through their faith in Him. Very clear. Not by works, but by faith. That's why believers are, are not here. They are not, they are not being judged by their works. It's because they have been justified. They are in Christ. Their sins are forgiven. Their sins are not remembered. Their sins are not counted against them. <laughs> but those outside of Christ are judged according to what they have done. It says it twice there. And look, it says books, doesn't it? First, books that record what people have done, what these people have done. I, th I think of computers here. I think of all the memory in computers and how people say you really can't erase anything from your computer. It's, it's all there, and it can be brought back and, and used against you in, in a sense. I, I, I think of the, the, the fact that now we're storing all of this information in the cloud, out there somewhere. You have no, no way of, of retracting it, of, of, of erasing it, of, of, getting, of getting rid of it. And you think about it, people do the most stupid things. They do horrible things and they video themselves and they take pictures of themselves doing it with, with, their, with their, their phones or whatever and, and it's there forever. And, and I look at this and I think God is, God is so much more capable <laughs> than any of that to remember, to record, to bring back everything, everything that we have done. Every thought, every motive, every word, and everything. It buries us, doesn't it? Completely buries us. And He brings it to bear against them at this, this throne as grounds for conviction. Our verse there in verse 12 again says books, plural. God's Word will be there. Listen to John 12, 48. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. God's Word bears witness, doesn't it, against us. God's Word shows us His, his heart. It shows us his, his will. It shows us what He has commanded of us. And it shows us how, how fallen we are. The book of life is also there. Jesus told the 72 disciples who went out, uh, who, who went out uh, dis, uh, knocking doors and, and witnessing for Him, and they came back and they were all excited because the spirits were subject to them. They actually cast out demons, and they're totally excited about this. And you remember what Jesus says? He says, don't rejoice about that. Rejoice rather that your names are recorded in heaven. You want to get excited about something? Get excited about the fact that eternity is coming and your name is on the registry. Ancient cities used to keep a, a registry of, of all of their citizens. That's what this kind of, especially at this time, this is what comes to mind. Book of Life is mentioned several times in the book of Revelation. God's redeemed people, only the saved are recorded there in the book of life. I, I thought about the movie The Good Lie when I was thinking about this. The young boys in Africa who, uh, because of the civil war there, they were known as the Lost Boys in Sudan. Some of them walked thousands of miles out of Sudan to refugee camps uh, where they lived. This group that the movie was made about lived in limbo for 15 years. Uh, the movie shows them as little boys uh, walking across the desert in Sudan. And in the next scene, you see their, their young men. 15 years later, 
doing nothing, sitting in a refugee camp. And what's interesting is they're, they're waiting for a home. They're waiting to be given a new country, to be sent somewhere. And if you look this movie up online, one of the scenes you'll see most often that represents this movie is when they've just heard that they have a home. When this group that the movie is about realize they're going, their name's on the list, and they're totally excited. And it's funny because they're jumping and screaming and rejoicing. And, and they say, we're going to Kansas City. You know, they don't, they don't even know where it is. They don't know how to say it, but it's like it's not here. <laughs> it's somewhere else. It's a, it's a wonderful movie. I can't, I can't speak for all the parts in it, so be careful. But, but it made me think about this. Philippians 4, 3 says, Our citizenship is in heaven, and we are going there. And the, the fact that the book of life records that God has a record. God knows who are His. And He has a home for them. And they are not here at this judgment. Look at that again. Two times it says, they are judged according to what they had done. According to what they had done. Several places in Scripture were told that there will be varying degrees of punishment in hell, right? I mean, you just go down and think about uh, Jesus spoke of greater condemnation for the scribes and the Pharisees. He spoke of, in the parable of the faithful steward, uh, many lashes for one and not as many for another. He spoke of it uh, being more tolerable in Sodom and Gomorrah than for the cities who rejected the disciples who went to them. Constantly, again and again, he is, he is painting a picture that there will be more severe punishment for some than for others. And God is righteous and He is perfect in doling out justice. And some people will experience much more suffering in hell than others. So the grounds for conviction are, first, the, the books recording what they've done. Secondly, God's Word, which reveals truth. And the book of life, where if their names are not written, it's proof that they were not redeemed. Verse 13, look at, look at it there. The sea gave up the dead, and all who were in it, death and Hades gave up the dead, and all who were in them. And they were judged, each one gives a sense that every single unsaved person, regardless of where they died or how they ended up dead, they were rounded up and they were brought to this sentencing. Not one was missed. It's like earth was turned over and shaken and everything, everyone is there. Look at the conviction and the sentencing. The lake of fire. Verses 14 and 15. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Some people may be thinking, you don't really believe that, do you? You don't really take that literally, do you? You know, Jesus taught more about hell than he did about heaven. He warned more about hell than telling nice stories about heaven. If you find yourself doubting the reality of what we're reading here, go back and think about Jesus. Think about the person, Jesus. A, a real person in time, in history. The, the, the ripples of His existence, the effect of His life are still lapping on shore, aren't they? We're still feeling the effects of, of His life. There are things going on now that were not going on before He came. And when He came, so many things changed. He stepped into our world. He claimed to be God. And He was so astoundingly wise spoke with such authority that pe people were shocked. They said, no, no one ever spoke like Him. He spoke truth like no one ever did. He was so loving and so kind like no one ever. And that person, that when you read through the Gospels, this is, this is, this is believable as you look at this. And now we see the effects. We see the evidence. That person talked about hell. And he said, it's a real place. 
And there is real suffering. And the punishment is forever. You know, God, God has to punish sin. Otherwise, He is not good. He is not just. Hell proves His righteousness, doesn't it? Warren Wiersbe gave three things that, that hell gives witness to. It proves His righteousness. It proves man's responsibility. Unlike today, you do a, you do a search for uh, you know, uh, dismissed trials or, or whatever, which I did, trying to find a, a, a trial that you know, I, could, I could learn something from and teach from. And, and all I found was again and again and again, this person was innocent. This person spent decades. This person spent 10 years and 5 years in prison. He was totally innocent. He was proved innocent. Unlike, unlike today, everyone who ends up here they are guilty. I thought psychologists, you know, would have only parents in hell. Right? They're the ones responsible for all, all of our problems. Now we are responsible. Hell proves the decisions were not someone else's fault. Hell proves that we are not a victim. And he says, finally, hell proves the awfulness of sin. If we could see sin as God sees sin, we would understand that such a place as hell has to exist. A lake of fire. Mentioned several times there in those last couple of verses. Swallows up everything. Everything that's not redeemed by Christ. Death and Hades, in fact, are thrown into the lake of fire. I read that and I thought, what does that mean? How is death and Hades? Death and Hades are done. They're gone. They're a thing of the past at this point. They'll never threaten again. We'll never hear about them again. A thing of the past. You look at this and you think, God has provided such a, such a gracious way of escape through Christ through His atoning death, which clothes us with perfect righteousness. As, as Paul says there, a righteousness from God, <laughs> a righteousness outside of ourselves that is covering us. Pays our sin debt. It brings us to God. It makes us His children. It makes us co-heirs with Christ to live for eternity in His presence. So you think, why... Why would we step away from this? Because we don't believe. Again, because of that horrible, horrible sin of unbelief. So here we have the great white throne judgment. There will be a judge. He is perfectly righteous. He will show no compassion. It feels weird saying that, doesn't it? But here's a day when He will show no compassion. There will not be a jury. One is not needed because God is omniscient. He knows everything. There is a prosecution. There is no defense. There is a conviction. And there are no higher courts to appeal to. It's done. It's decided. Before God ushers in chapter 21, the new heaven and the new earth, He has to deal with sin. And He has to put it away. So have you thought seriously about where you stand? Don't think that I've got plenty of time to deal with this later. I'm having fun right now. I've got a lot of things going on in my life. We are not promised time, are we? And there's also a real danger in putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. And we become more and more calloused and more and more hardened to the things of God. If you've not trusted Christ for your salvation, ask Him to give you a clear picture of where you stand. Lost and separated, an object of His wrath, name not written in the book of life, ask Him to show you clearly that. And ask Him to grant you repentance, grant you a softened heart, a broken heart, Cry out for Him to save you. We're promised that He will not turn you away. Let's pray. Father, again, thank You for such plain language. 
Thank you for such a clear warning. Thank you for the beginning of the book of Revelation, Revelation that promises a blessing to everyone who reads and heeds what's contained here. To read and to believe and to act upon the salvation that you've provided in light of this suffering and this judgment should be a no-brainer. Father, I pray that you'll help us to see the blessing that is contained here. You speak to us very clearly and you show us the end. You show us what's coming. I pray, Father, that you will do a work in all of our hearts, all of our minds, open our eyes, help us to see ourselves and help us to see what you've provided for us. I pray, Father, that uh, you'll open our eyes and we will exercise faith and trust you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.